Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So, welcome to Taco Tuesday. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. It may be short. It may be long. It may be interrupted. There may be an action sequence. We don't know what happens. We just go with the flow. So, as people are coming on, I'm just out with the beat. I don't, it, I'm telling you. This music is fire. This music is fire. Anyway, while I wait for people to jump on. Your tempo is zoop. And of course, you can't read backwards. But if you could, it would say Nolensville, Tennessee. Hallelujah. So if you're in Nashville, you just head straight south. You're in Murfreesboro. Google it. <laughs> no, it's not bad. But. Today we're going to talk a little bit about a time to get mad. I can't do a good mad face. I wish I could. You can show me your good mad face. It's tough. I'm not normally mad. So it's hard to show a mad face. You can't just put it on. Can't do it. Anyway. We're going to be today in our Bible. If you don't have your Bible, go grab one. Please don't grab a Bible that does not belong to you. Um, grab a Bible that does, or, you know, ask to borrow a Bible. You know, as long as you ask, it's borrowing. If you take without asking, it's illegal, and I will turn you in. Hopefully there's a reward. Um, but yeah, Camp Boy Zoo, if you're in Nashville, come on down. Um, we're going to do a little bit more after we go off, possibly. Depend who shows up. But we're here with the great ships and of course the great work. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. It is a beautiful day out here, by the way. It's like 75 degrees without a breeze. It is amazing. See the blue skies there? Beautiful and blue. My fingers coming into the frame at some point. There it is. Beautiful blue skies. Hallelujah. Delicious tea. First Samuel 17 is where we are. And we're talking about a time to get angry. So where in the world did this crazy idea come from? My mama. I blame my mama. Mama, if you ever watch this, uh, my mama, I think, is like trying to catch up on the different ones I've done. And uh, it's funny when your mom watches you preach and teach. It's funny, you know. Cause I'll share a testimony. She'll be like, I didn't know that. I'm like, mom, I didn't, I, I, that's right, I didn't tell you. <laughs> um, so it's fun. But yeah, my mom actually was talking to me and she said, you can't be afraid and angry at the same time. She said, you cannot be afraid and angry at the same time. You're either one or the other. So we've been dealing with the spirit of fear. We've been dealing with anxiety. We've been dealing with hesitancy. People being afraid to just do this. Look at this. I want to show you how beautiful this is right here. Taking a Taco Tuesday tour. All the wonderful people out here eating. I love it. I love it. And then earlier today, I was out at a different park that I normally go to, and it was filled with kids, and it was amazing. Kids were out having a good time, enjoying themselves, and that's really what it should be, right? People having a good time. No fear lives here. So, First Samuel 17, hopefully you're there. And we're gonna talk a little bit, dance a little bit, talk a little bit about a time to get angry. Hallelujah. All right, so we're gonna start with 17. The Philistines now mustered their army for a battle and camp between Sokoth and Judah and Asakah at wherever that place is. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the Valley of Allah. So the Philistines and Israelites face each other on opposite hills with the valley in between. So you got the picture, right? Israelites over here, Philistines over here, and a big deep valley in the middle, right? So the fight would be in the, in the valley, right? So let's see what happens. Verse four, then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. 
He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his coat, I'm sorry, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. Big dude, not a small guy at all. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed, up, I'm sorry, 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying his shield. Verse 8. Watch verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted a ton across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming to fight? Why are you even showing up? Why did you even come today? Why did you waste your time and show up? I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. I am a champion. You are just servants. I'm a fighter. You just take orders. Now, watch this. He didn't say you're servants of the Most High God. He didn't say you're children of God. He said you're servants of Saul. So as they heard that, they actually believed that and said, you know what? He's right. Like, he's nine feet tall. Saul's not that tall. He's tall, but he's not nine feet tall, right? So if Saul's the best we have, and Goliath is the best they have, <clears throat> it's not looking good. But the Israelites forgot that they had somebody else in the army. Watch. <clears throat> so we're in verse 8. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. So he goes down to the valley and he's like, you know what? Bring your best guy. Bring your best guy. Let's just do this. Me, the best guy over here. I'm a champion. I got the belt. Son, you don't want any of this smoke in the valley, right? Bring me the best fighter you have, and if I knock him out, if I kill him, then all of y'all gonna be our slaves. But if you kill me, which y'all won't do, then I'll be, and everybody else will be dead, but everybody else will be your slaves, right? So this is just a one-on-one -on -one battle for everything. Nation against nation, but they're gonna make it one-on-one. -on -one. That's kind of like how basketball is now. It's like everybody else just goes to the right side, and on the left side is like two guys playing one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know why, but for some reason, that's how they do it. So they decide, okay, put the armies aside. Best guy versus best guy. Okay? So here we go. Verse 10. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified. And not terrified, I'm sorry. Terrified is when you're scared and hungry and you go get chicken. Um, terrified is when you're scared. They are terrified and deeply shaken. So fear got them and it didn't let them go. They were afraid. They did not want to go fight this guy, right? And so, here comes David, right? So, and I'm gonna skip a little bit for time's sake, but David basically sent out by his father to bring some food to his brothers. His brothers are out there. They're the ones that are afraid. They're the ones that are deeply shaken, right? And so, David comes out there with the food and he's just being a good brother doing what his father asked him. Um, and this actually, I'm sorry, let me back up. This actually was going on for 40 days. So this wasn't just one day of the giant saying, hey, y'all come on, fight me. 40 days, 40 days. He's just sitting there talking crazy for 40 days. Some of y'all have TVs that are talking crazy for multiple days. You have news anchors, politicians, whoever. And everything they say makes you terrified and deeply shaken. Everything you're hearing come out of the valley is making you terrified and deeply shaken to the point you don't want to come into the valley and you don't want to fight. And you've almost surrendered everything that you have, all of your freedom, and became a slave. Why? Because you've heard the propaganda and you're terrified and deeply afraid. Forty days of this. Day one they were terrified and deeply shaken. How many more? Forty. Where were they at at forty? Anyway. Hallelujah. Actually, let's pick up there. Let's have fun. Verse 16. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. For 40 days, morning and evening. That boy was working hard. He was working the day shift and the night shift. Morning news and evening news. Verse 17. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grains, where you're taking the food, 
and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give them these ten cuts of cheese to the captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring them back a report of how they're doing. David's brothers were with Saul, what we just said, and Israelite army at the valley fighting against the Philistines. They weren't really fighting. Right. So David left the sheep with another shepherd. Be careful. He didn't leave the sheep with just anybody. He left the sheep with another shepherd, somebody else who'd be willing to lay down their life for the sheep. So David made sure, hey, this is something I'm responsible for. I'm going to be given a second responsibility, but let me place the first responsibility in the hands of somebody who's equally responsible while I go take care of responsibility number two. So I'm going to do both things, but I'm going to make sure nothing drops, right? So David's on top of his shepherding responsibility like a boss. David is doing his job, right? Above and beyond. Verse 20. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts. He's bringing gifts. People come with gifts. I like people with gifts. Amazon workers, they can bring anything they want, drop it off at the house. As long as it's for me, not somebody else. Because then it's all in the situation. Anyway. David left with the sheep with another shepherd, set out in the early morning with the gifts, as Jesse had directed him, like his dad told him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to their ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gad came out from the ranks of the Philistines. Then David heard his shout, his usual shout, taunting the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. So all it took was just Goliath stepping out. As soon as he showed his face, everybody just ran. They didn't want a piece of that. Like they were fighting and everything, and Goliath, oh no, we gotta go. We gotta go. No, it's Goliath. Come on. Let's go. Drop your shield. Drop your shield. Drop your sword. Drop everything. Just go. Just go. Just leave him there. He won't make it. Just leave him. Sorry, Cletus. We gotta go. Okay? So they saw Goliath and they ran. Verse 20. Wait, I'm going to point this out. Verse 23, it ends with, Then David heard his shout. So David never heard this before. They had, were used to hearing They heard it for 40 days. Right? Nobody fought Goliath. Heard it for 40 days. Didn't mess with Goliath. David hears it one day. David decides, I'm going to do something about this. Right? Watch this. I'm spoiling it. I know. But it's still good. Um, verse 25. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. And the man's entire family will be exempted from paying tax. So not only do you get the giant killer badge for your Boy Scout sash or Boy Scout, whatever they have with the sashes and the, yeah, that thing. But he also gets exempt from paying taxes, his whole family, and he gets a wife, right? I mean, you could die, but if you don't and you win, it's not a bad deal, right? But you could die. 26. David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing the Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? So David took notice that he was defying Israel. Wait a second. Wait a second. Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? You see, something happened with David when he heard all that. He heard people talking about his God. He heard people defying the armies of the living God. People talking against what we would now call the church. People saying things against the church. People saying things against God. People putting God down, saying the church doesn't have any power. God doesn't have any power. The church has nothing on this. And they were just continually pushing their champion. So there's this big bad evil and everybody's promoting this big bad evil and saying this big bad evil is going to take everybody out. Nobody can defeat this thing. This thing is so big. It's so bad. It is the champion. It has never been defeated. There's not one of you that can take this thing out. So people are pumping up this big Goliath and making him see like he's larger than life. And the Israelites are believing and they're so afraid. David hears it. David hears something else. Wait a second. You just talking about my daddy? Did you just... Did you just say something about my dad? Something rises up in David. Why? Because he has a relationship with the living God. It's like when somebody, when I was a kid in school, somebody say something about your mom, you ready to fight. When somebody says something, wait, what? What? Somebody saying something about David's father, 
understand who David is. David is out there with the sheep all day, and he's got nobody but the sheep and God. His brothers don't treat him right. He's just out there. God is like his best friend. It's his father. It's his protector. It's his provider. God is everything to David. And he hears this uncircumcised Philistine. That's what it says in another translation. Uncircumcised, which means he has no covenant, which means he has no God backing him up. So I have a God that I'm in covenant with, that I, that I know if I go out to fight, God's fighting with me. This little ninja doesn't have anybody, and he's talking about the God who I love. Wait a second, right? <laughs> Verse 27. And these men gave David the same reply, and they said, Yes, it is a reward for killing. But when David's oldest brother, Elab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. So now his brother decides to get angry. His brother doesn't get angry at the fact that Goliath is yelling these things and Goliath is talking about God. He's not angry. Not angry. He's not angry at the fact that the army is getting beat down every day. Not angry. Not angry that after 40 days, they're no better than they were before. Not angry. Not angry. All these things are being said about God and about who they believe in. Not angry. But as soon as David starts asking questions, his brother is ready to smack David across the face. He is so upset with David. It says, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just came here to see the battle. You just came out to see a fight. I know you. I, you good for nothing, shepherd. What did you do with those sheep you're supposed to be watching over? Right? Funny thing is, David left the sheep with somebody else who was just as capable of watching the sheep as him. He didn't leave the sheep with a hireling, which is somebody who really doesn't care about the sheep. He left the sheep with a shepherd. So the sheep had a shepherd watching over. David came to the battlefield to... Ba Ooh. See, I almost, I almost slipped right there. But watch this. What's interesting is, if you have a job and you're not doing it, and God's giving you that assignment and you don't take it, God will send somebody else to take the assignment that you're supposed to take and will complete the assignment. Notice, David didn't let go of his first assignment. He just said, hey, I need somebody to watch these sheep. Why? Because my father is telling me to go somewhere else. But he didn't realize it was a setup for something bigger. So there's people who aren't afraid of giants who are going to be called to do multiple things in the kingdom. You're going to have multiple things to do. You're going to have to raise people up to take care of one thing while you go and take care of another because your brothers in battle aren't doing the job they were supposed to do because they've been listening to the lies and the propaganda and the fear. And they become so terrified and frightened that they won't move. And it's been 40 days and nothing's happened. So you're going to have to leave one assignment with a shepherd and go do another assignment Here we go. Verse 29. What have I done now? David replied, I was only asking a question. I was only asking a question. It's funny. You start asking questions, people get mad at you. All you got to do is ask a question. Try me. Try it right now. Just ask a question. Ask a question. You know what? I like questions. So, when I go to the restaurant, when I walk in, but when I sit down, Somehow, I'm safe. I don't. People get mad. Ask a question. People get mad. So on the airplane, we're sitting next to each other, and it's closed in. Oh no, we're just one one space apart. One space. Okay, was it three feet? Four feet. But we're in clothes with mask on, and we're safe. But when we go to church. How, how come that doesn't work? People will get mad at you. Go and ask a question today. People will get mad at you for simply asking a question. David asked a question, and they get mad at him. Funny how that works. <laughs> what have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. Verse 30, he walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Somebody snitched on David. Somebody went and told King Saul, look, hey, David, this guy's over asking all these questions, man. He's been walking around asking everybody the same question. You might want to check on him. You might want to see about him. So anyway, somebody pulls a Karen on David, <laughs> snitches on David, and now David has to go talk to the king. All right? Here we go. So King Saul sends for him, verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. 
verse 33. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. So the deck is stacked. Isn't it funny that God uses the small things to take out the big things to prove that it wasn't a small thing, but it's actually a big, 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 big God. It's a little spoiler, but let's just go for it. Hallelujah. Verse 34, but David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. David had confidence that the Lord was with him. Why? Because he was fighting battles that nobody ever saw. There's people who fight battles and nobody ever sees the battles they fight. They have victories over things nobody ever knows about. It. Like secret victories, secret battles. There's nobody applauding for you. There's no applause. There's no crowd. It's just you, God, the sheep, and a lion. And the lion's hungry and the sheep are looking at you like, it's, do your job. It's time for you to do your job. So David steps up, he takes out a lion, he takes out a bear, and it builds his confidence. Now, does it build his confidence in himself? Nope. Does it build his confidence in his fighting abilities? No. Does it build his confidence in anything else? No, watch this. What does he say? He says, doo -doo 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 -doo. verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. So David understood. When I got in the fight back in the forest, or the pasture, or the meadow, whatever you call it, I was fighting lions and I was fighting bears, and it was God who gave me the victory over them. So the same God that gave me victory over them for a couple of sheep, you don't think he's going to do that for his own people? You don't think he's not going to stand up for his own name? Come on now, son. Come on now. Of course God's with me. We can do this. You know what? I can do this because God is with me. Right? He doesn't listen to the propaganda of the... Goliath doesn't listen to what he's saying. He knows by experience what God has done. And he actually encourages himself by reminding himself of what God's brought him through. Sometimes you got to remind yourself, wait a second. God brought me through this. God brought me through that. God brought me through that. And I'm going to sit here and think that God won't bring me through this. This is where, like, doesn't make sense. That's like somebody taking you halfway to your full journey. If you got an Uber and you took an Uber somewhere on the other side of town, he drops you off in the middle of town. It's like, I didn't pay for this. I paid for you to take me all the way. God's not going to drop you off halfway. Halfway through your destiny, halfway through your call, halfway through what he has for you. He's not going to give up on you and just let you be taken out by some giant halfway. The same God that was with you in the beginning is the same God that's going to be with you in the end. But you just have to have faith and believe that God is with you in every battle and not back down because of fear, but step up because of faith because you know you have a covenant with a God who is bigger than anything that could ever come against you. Hallelujah. Let's go. Verse 38. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I never put this on before a day in my life. I don't know that this isn't how I fight. This isn't David. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. Verse 40, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into a shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. So he just had what he knew. He said, look, I, I, these are weapons I'm familiar with. Look, I know how to handle business with this right here. That's all I need, right? And so, what does it say? Verse 41. Goliath walked toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt, and this ruddy-faced boy. So you got a man versus a boy, a giant versus a not giant, right? Sword versus rock. <laughs> Doesn't look like a good battle. Verse 43. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? Well, actually, that's me. That's, that's what I would have said. <laughs> Are you a dog? Let me tell you something. Anyway. Verse 43, and my dog, <laughs> that he roared at David, that you come and weep with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his God. He's cursing David out. Blankety, 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 blankety. That's what he's saying to David. Verse 44, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and your wild an and wild animals, Goliath, yo. 
So he's still talking. Still going. Right? 45. Watch what David does. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Notice, before David ever fights, David starts talking. A lot of times we lose because we're afraid to talk. What are you talking? What's coming out of your mouth? Because what happens is fear comes into our ear, and what do we do? We just start telling everybody about fear. Oh, you, you hear about Goliath? You hear about Goliath? Oh my goodness, he's so big, he said he's going to smack us in the next Tuesday. He said he said he could crush us like a sword of okay. cake. Oh, did you hear what Goliath said? And they repeat all of the fear. Stop repeating fear. Start repeating the word of God. Start repeating faith. Start repeating what God is speaking to you in your spirit. You have to go out. David was out in the quiet places. Heard from the Lord. And he spoke what he heard from the Lord. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. He said, wait a second. I know what's backing me up. I know who's backing me up. Let's back up. I want to show you something really cool. You want to see something cool? Ready for it? Ready for it? Here we go. Hold your space. Go back. Go back to chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse 13. So we're still in 1 Samuel. Just a little back. I had to flip one page. Maybe two for you. If you have a big print Bible. 1 Samuel 16. Looking at verse 13. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. So what happened? David was anointed before he ever got into battle. David had an anointing on him from Samuel, who was the prophet, who had the anointing on him. So the man of God with the anointing was giving the anointing on David. Watch this. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Saul ret or Samuel returned. So, what have we been talking about? For two weeks, this will be week three. We've been talking about a spirit of power. So David had on him a spirit of power. So David knew, I'm anointed. There's the Holy Ghost is on me. There's a spirit on me of power. The Lord is with me strong. I don't go out here and just fight the fight. David wasn't just looking for a fight. You know, you want some of this? David wasn't just looking for a fight. But there was a giant that was defying God, that was coming against God, coming against the nation, coming against everything that he stood for. And he's like, we can't stand for this. Because if David didn't stand up, what would have happened? Would Israel be slaves now? And if you're slaves, do you have your own beliefs? Do you have your own things you can do? No. Their traditions and everything they believed in would have got kicked out. David's like, we ain't going to have this. So David decides to stand up for an entire nation. Let's see what happens. Let's finish this out. Hallelujah. And then, verse 46, I'll start 46 again. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. So he stands up and he says, look, this isn't just one fight. This isn't just David versus Goliath. No, no. This is the Lord versus anything. This is the Lord versus anything. When the Lord is coming against anything, the Lord wins. David said, this is a statement victory. I'm not just beating you because I got nothing to do, because I like a good fight. But I'm beating you, and I'm going to defeat you. And I'm going to make it as a testimony. And here it is as a testimony. How many thousands of years later? Still a testimony to how strong and how powerful God is. He says, and look at this in the end of uh, 46. He says, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Wow. Wow. His vision was bigger than one fight. People think it's just a small battle. It's not a small battle. Your vision has to be bigger than the battle. You understand. 
when God wins a battle, God gets glory and his glory gets told about through the whole earth. And for thousands of years, we've been telling them about one fight, one fight for thousands of years because of how amazing it was and how much glory God got out of it. Hallelujah. So think about that. God could give you a fight to fight, that if you fight that fight the right way and you fight it with God, you fight it for God, people can be talking about it way after you're dead. If you don't, you don't make it to the rapture, let's say, Jesus tarried, you're on the earth, you pass away, people still talking, man, let me tell you what happened. That thing was amazing, right? Why? Because he was making, he's making a move for the Lord, making a mark on history. 47. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. He will give you to us. So he said, look, I don't have a sword. I don't have a spear. I got a rock that I found over there by that muddy river. And it's got your name on it. Hallelujah. 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Did you catch that? As Goliath moved closer to attack, David ran out quickly to meet him. David wasn't backing up. David was like, whoa, 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 hey, 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 I was just talking. I was excited. I got caught up in the moment. That's not what David said. David came at him, swinging that thing and running with everything he had. He was ready to take him out. There was no fear. There was absolutely no fear. What was it? There was an anger. David was angry. David was upset. David took that anger, which was of the Lord, and he took it to Goliath's head. Let's watch. Let's, let's watch. Let's read. You're not watching. You're watching, but you're listening, and hopefully you're reading. Possibly taking notes. It'd be great if we had a quiz. Just saying. Anyway. 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into a shepherd bag and taking out the stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So Goliath triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to cut him, I'm sorry, to kill him, and to cut off his head. So he did exactly what he said he was going to do. And he said, look, it's not about me. He said, it's about the Lord. The Lord gets the glory out of this. It's not David's an amazing fighter. The Lord gave Goliath to us today. I took a rock, smacked him in the head with a rock, a rock. <laughs> I don't know how big David's slingshot our hands were, but apparently he found a rock that was going to work. No, it was the Lord. The Lord put a little something extra on that rock. That rock had some mustard from heaven on it. You see what I'm saying? That rock had like an angel grab it and like, whoa, and that thing came and just hit him, pop, hit him, and it was over. Lights out. He was gone. Little X's on his eyes, and he just fell. He was gone. And David killed him, cut off his head. End of story. Good night. Anyway, let's finish this up. Verse, well, the end of verse 51. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. That's all it took. <laughs> That's all it took. The whole army ran when one guy fell. That's all it took. They're fighting for 40 days when all they had to do was just take out one guy. So we lost people. We lost people because nobody wanted to stand up to the one guy. Nobody wanted to stand up to fear. Nobody wanted to fight Goliath. So we lost people. Who would have just... Fifty-two. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines. What happened? They became emboldened. Boldness came upon them. Fear was gone. They were like, look, if that little ruddy kid can take out the biggest, baddest giant y'all got, look, with a rock. It's on. It is on. Let's do this. So fear went from one camp to another camp. And boldness came on to the Israelites. And all of a sudden, business got taken care of. That's what happened. I was just, I got to see this like a good movie of this. I want to see a good, good movie of this. Because the scene is amazing. Hallelujah. So they gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all about the road as far as Gath and Ekron. 
Then the Israelite army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. And David still had the head in his hand. Took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. I'm telling you, that's some crazy stuff. But that's where we got to get to. But notice, what pulled David into the fight? I mean, he was talking about what he would get. But what he couldn't stand was like, look, you can't sit here and talk about my God like that. Look, man, I, I don't even know you, bro, but you ain't going to be just doing this. Oh, hey, hello, 40 days? 40 days? You done, son. You done. You done. You, you out. Right? So there has to be like a Holy Ghost boldness. It has to be like a, wait a second, this isn't right. That rises up on the inside of us. Right? And a lot of people, it's like fear, <laughs> boldness. <laughs> You know, and you've got to stir yourself up so the boldness level increases. See how that works? And sometimes you get bold just because you get angry. You're not even thinking clearly. You're not sitting there thinking rationally like, you know what? He could eat me. He could probably eat me. But that's not what he's thinking. He's just upset. He's angry. How dare you? You ever just get so mad, you just stop thinking. You catch yourself like, whoa, what am I doing? The Bible says, be angry and sin not. So we're not talking about a sinful anger, an anger that leads to sin. We're talking about an anger over sin or an anger over unrighteousness. You see unrighteousness, you see something that's going on that shouldn't be going on. There should be something in you that gets upset about that. Wait a second, that's not right. No, that's not right. Something needs to be done about this. And you go and do whatever God has emboldened you and given you the boldness to do. And take authority and take charge and take out the lot. Because if you don't, there's other people that are going to be affected because you're supposed to be the one fighting the giant, but you're not. You know who was supposed to fight the giant? Saul. Saul was the biggest one for the Israelites. If Saul would have stood up, think about it. Saul was anointed. Saul was king. Saul was the biggest one there. Saul should have done what David did. But he didn't. So he lost men because he wouldn't stand up and do what God told him to do. So how many people are we willing to lose because we're not willing to stand up and do what God called us to do? You can't say, well, I'm afraid. Okay, you're afraid, but you're called. You're afraid, but you're anointed. You're afraid, but you're filled with the Holy Ghost. What do you expect other people to do? If not you, who? Are we going to have to go get David out of the field? Who's supposed to be watching sheep to come and fight because you're scared to fight? Or are you going to get angry enough and say, you know what, this fight is my fight. It's gone on way too long. I'm going to stand up and do something about this fight. We all have fights we have to stand up and take care of. Don't let somebody else fight your fight for you. That's embarrassing. Embarrassing. And you lose people. Unfortunately, there are consequences. So if you're called to stand up and fight a fight, fight the fight. And I pray you get angry. I pray you get upset. I pray something burns on the inside of you like never before. A Holy Ghost anger that ignites you into action to do exactly what God has called you to do for this hour. Amen? Amen. Wasn't going to be long. I don't know if I, how long I was. Let's see. Let's take a peek. Let's see. Oh, look at that. Not bad at all. But yeah, that's all for tonight. Still going to be here. It's still actually not that dark. You can see it's kind of darkening, but not that dark. So if you're still in the area on your way, come on through. Um, it is actually taco time. I don't eat tacos before because I'll get sleepy. So I just wait to after and do tacos. So if you're still in the area, you want to come through, come on. There's a lot more we can discuss. We still got another 65 books we can go through. Hallelujah. Blessings to y'all. Also, if you made it to the end, congratulations. If you want to give, um, we are taking money through Cash App, lead them to him. Cash App, lead them to him or PayPal. Uh, I think it's paypal.me backslash forward slash one of those slashes. Gary Winkfield, my name. Everything's going to be on Facebook. You can go back on my page, see it all there. Be a blessing so we can keep doing what we're doing. 
And if you're in the area, a triple dog dare you to come out. Triple dog dare you. Don't listen to the giant. Come out. Blessings to y'all. See you soon.